when we started first engaging in agriculture happened around 10,000 years ago. Our population around that time was about a million. Then it took us about 10,000 years to reach our first billion people. And that happened around 1800. From 1800 onward, due to a number of advances in medicine, technology, fossil fuel discovery, our population grew exponentially from a billion to 8 billion in 200 years. During that same time period that the population grew by a factor of 8, our consumption grew by a factor of 100. We are currently demanding 75% more from Earth than it can support sustainably. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter, and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week I spoke with Nandita Bajaj. Nandita is the executive director of Population Balance, the organization which offers education and solutions to address the intersectional impacts of human overpopulation and overconsumption on the planet, people, and animals. She also co-hosts the Overpopulation podcast, which I will put links to, and teaches at the Institute for Humane Education at Antioch University, where she researches pronatalism and human supremacy and their impacts on reproductive, ecological, and intergenerational justice. Nandita joined me to discuss the link between pronatalism, the cultural beliefs and mechanisms which drive women to have children, and also our population growth. She explains the link between population and consumption and the impact on planet. She explains the importance of revealing pronatalist thinking as a way of overcoming our patriarchal society. She explains how the ideology of pronatalism has allowed us to become divorced as a species from our natural environment. And she explains how the elevation of rights of all people, whether it's women being liberated from merely being reproductive vessels, whether it's children who have the right to be born into a healthy, sustainable world, whether it's the right of the species with whom we share this planet and their right to environment. She explains how this elevation must be fundamental in any climate policy if we are to address the instability and unsustainability of our world and create an equitable and just world for all. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. Nandita, thank you so much for joining me on Planet Critical. I'm so excited to speak with you today. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. I'm equally excited. Especially since, I mean, this has sort of been in the works for a couple of months, but since uh, we started organizing this, the population debate has kind of exploded around the effective altruism movement as well, which I would love to get into very quickly uh, because I'm sort of fascinated by those mad people in Silicon Valley. <laughs> but before we do that, could you explain to people how it was that you came to work on population and overpopulation as sort of this problem of, of resource and the climate crisis? Yeah, I'll go back a little bit in mm -hmm. my history because it, it actually started out with a personal experience that I had, which then turned into uh, research and then it became more of an advocacy career for me. Mm -hmm. So now I work completely exclusively in this field. Um, so going back a little bit, I was born and raised in India, and I moved to Canada with my family in my late teens. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents had afforded me a high degree of autonomy to choose my own life paths, which included, uh, you know, a lot of eclectic things like taking flight lessons, becoming an aerospace engineer, <laughs> uh, switching over to high school teaching, 
and even marrying someone outside of my religion and race. Um, and despite my relative independence and this proc proclivity toward, um, you know, being an ambitious person, there was one thing I had never questioned, which was the seeming inevitability that I was going to become a mother. And it wasn't until my late 20s when my partner, now husband, and I started exploring our future plans. And we kind of collectively had this realization uh, that because of our, um, you know, our commitment to the environment, we were both minimalists, we were both conscious about our impact on the environment. We had this conversation about kids. And both of us realized that until that moment, nobody had ever asked us that question. Mm. And even actually engaging in a conversation about having or not having kids, I found that to be incredibly liberating. Because up until that moment, like I said, I did not know that I had a choice to not have children. It was a given. It was something that I was, you know, it was the water in which I was swimming, something I'd grown mm. up with culturally, within education, media, anywhere I looked. It's the only dominant path that was available to me. So the fact that I could choose not to have children uh, was the start of this journey for me. It was extremely joyful, liberating, and it was a moment of profound awakening. And that's kind of how this whole path started for me, is I, I started to wonder, you know, how many people were there around the world like me who had grown up to believe that parenthood was their destiny? And, you know, for those who authentically wished to become parents, how much autonomy were they actually afforded to decide when and with whom and mm -hmm. how many children to have? And so I kind of started exploring this topic through research and through interviews with people around the world. And I learned that this strong force has a name and it's called pronatalism, which is the, the social and institutional bias towards having children. And as I started to do the research, I also started to notice that <clears throat> uh, how ironic it was that I was raised in a country that is now this year set to become the most populated country in the world, where pronatalism was the fabric of the culture. It was a given. And so then I started really making this connection between pronatalism and population growth and how intertwined they were. Um, the fact that a lot of people, especially women around the world, and I'll go into pronatalism a bit more later, but just in terms of the intro, as I started to unpack pronatalism and just how pervasive and insidious and autonomy diminishing it is as a force, I started to wonder, you know, how much is the population growth driven by pronatalism? And um, I ended up going to grad school to do a degree um, in this area, and uh, I teach a course on it now. But that was the start of the journey for me was to make the link between these pervasive pressures placed on people institutionally, culturally, through family, through education, um, that push us into parenthood regardless of what we truly desire, that prevent us from actually exploring authentically uh, whether or not and when to have children, and to make that decision kind of in a liberated and responsible way. It's the most, it's the most consequential decision we make in our mm -hmm. lives. And the fact that so many people around the world have no choice in the matter, to me, was just shocking. And that's when I also started to really make the connection between population um, and pronatalism, even though I had been interested in population for a very long time and since my adulthood, since moving to Canada, basically, and, and drawing the comparison between living in an extremely populated country, um, looking at the, looking at the, um, 
the undermining of human rights and all the social and ecological crises that were going on within that country, and then making this connection with how does that relate to feminism and reproductive autonomy? Um, you know, why is it that most countries where women have more autonomy, the fertility rate tends to be lower and, and vice versa. And so that's, that's where I really started to become interested in looking at more the intersectional components of social justice, ecological justice, how all of this impacts the non-human world, you know, how it's premised on reproductive injustice, but how it's also a cause. Population growth is also a cause for a lot of our social and ecological crises. I think let's let's um, give some data points uh, for people who might not know, and I don't know this off the top of my head, so I'm hoping you might. What has been our population curve globally over the last 100 years? Because it is abnormal that the population size of the human species today is huge <laughs> in comparison to the rest of history. <laughs> And thank you for asking that question because um, it's incredible how many people don't know what what the sustainable population size is, what the quote unquote normal is supposed to be, uh, and part of it is that we grow up uh, kind of with this baseline of whatever we are used to seeing around us, and we grow up to see that as normal, mm -hmm. and so. You know, looking at, well, learning from a lot of ecologists and scientists who have lived to, to see a population quadruple within their lifetime has wow. been one of the most, I think, awakening experiences because you can actually hear from their stories all of what they've seen become lost during that time. But in terms of the data, so... Um, Approximately so, the agricultural revolution, or when we started first engaging in agriculture, happened around 10,000 years ago. And um, I think our population around that time was about a million or less. And then, and that period is called the Holocene. And that was also when the last ice age happened, and the period follow, following that is called the Holocene. And um, then it took us about 10,000 years to reach our first billion people, and that happened around 1800. And that was due to a number of advances um, from, sorry, from 1800 onward, due to a number of advances in medicine, technology, fossil fuel discovery. Our population grew exponentially from a billion to 8 billion in 200 years. So think about that. It took us 10,000 years to get to the first billion. And then in 200 years, we jumped from a billion to 8 billion. Mm -hmm. And so scientists are actually, they actually call this current blip in our deep time history of 300,000 year history as homo sapiens and aberration. There's nothing normal about the way in which we have colonized our planet decimated most other life on Earth, and it's never happened as a result of human-driven activity, and it's, it's no surprise that it's epo this epoch is now called the Anthropocene. So I, I hope that that gives you, gives you an idea, and interestingly, during that same time period that the population grew by a factor of eight, our consumption grew by a factor of 100. And Ooh. so... You know, according to the Global Footprint Network, we are currently demanding 75% more from Earth than it can support sustainably. 75%. Exactly. So we're, we're basically using 1.75 Earths. Well, and people might say, well, where's that extra 75% coming from? Because we've only got one Earth. Um, and, you know, some of the, the most wonderful scientists and ecologists have done all of the work in, in making these explanations so simple. So I'll kind of just use their 
uh, analogy, it's like living off of a credit card rather mm. than living off of your interest. Um, you're living off of your principal in the account. So you're basically eating away at your principal instead of using your interest so you can use that perpetually, which is what sustainability would mean, mm. uh, is you keep your principal amount in the bank perpetually. You never touch it. And whatever you make on top of that is what you use. Right. But what we're doing is we're eating away at what Dr. Bill Reese likes to say, the biophysical basis of our own existence. And so what that means, where is that extra 75% coming from, is we're taking that away from the future. Um, so anybody that's born today or in the future will not have access to that anymore because the earth is not able to keep up with its regenerative capacity. What are we talking about there? Are we talking about uh, fresh water? Are we talking about food? Are we talking about the impacts of our pollution and therefore climate change? Could you break it down a little bit? Yes, um, all of the things that you said. Um, so, um, you know, we extract from Earth and Earth regenerates. So there is kind of a symbiotic relationship that we do have the capacity to extract a bit in terms of what we call resources, um, you know, it, it, yeah, in terms of materials, in terms of, so resources would be water, air, um, all of the, you know, soil, the minerals, and um, the fine metals that we use for our um, technologies. Um, so all of that would be considered the extraction material, and then the earth is able to absorb a lot of the byproduct or the waste um, into itself. Uh, and so what's happening right now is our waste output, the pollution uh, that we're creating, land, water, uh, air, is far greater than what the earth can absorb and um, rest you know, regenerate. Uh, come back from that kind. So our waste output is a lot greater than um, what we what the earth can keep up with. And right. we're, you know, extracting a lot faster than what the earth can regenerate. Hmm. And I mean, we're also surely now extracting things that probably can't be regenerated or can't be regenerated in a short time frame. You know, I'm thinking of all our precious mineral, precious metals. You know, typically gold doesn't grow on trees or lithium or or any of these things that we need for our technologies. Exactly. Exactly. There is a limit to the availability of these resources, uh, and we are going to run out of them. Mm. Um, so, you know, you talk a lot about in your um, podcast, and which is why I was so excited to talk to you, is uh, this idea of infinite growth on a finite planet, this idea that we can just keep taking and building and expanding and colonizing without ever having to worry about limits. And unfortunately, that's a fallacy in our thinking. That's a very arrogant supremacist view of the planet where we look at it as a resource factory uh, rather than uh, this incredible, regenerative, you know, miraculous planet uh, that doesn't exist as far as we know anywhere else in the universe. Um, so we've um, looked at it as this infinite, you know, resource factory that we can keep exploiting um, without understanding that, well, there are limits to these resources. Um, like you said, a lot of these precious metals, we're, we're go going to run out. And we yeah. are running out. Uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> to, to anybody listening, <laughs> there is a cat on me, which is why we've come to a pause. Here you go. <laughs> um, sorry, Luna interrupted you. <laughs> no, no. So that's the idea is we are not used to. So we're the first species that has basically allowed ourselves to uh, grow past our limits. Every other species lives within its own 
um, you know, capacity, the caring capacity. And we are the first species that has exploited and kind of broken these, defied these laws of nature um, that no other species mostly has done. Um, and, you know, because a lot of the time nature will impose its own limits uh, on us. And somehow we have temporarily outdone nature. And we are going to have limits imposed on us. We already are having limits impo imposed on us by nature. Uh, but then there is this kind of supremacist worldview that makes us think, well, that's okay. We'll just go to Mars and colonize and um, all of, yeah, we'll just recreate another mm -hmm. Earth, which is literally impossible, but yeah. that's part of the human supremacist worldview. <laughs> Okay, before we get on to Elon, and don't get me wrong, I'm dying to, I want to make a jump into the, <laughs> the, the pronatalism and feminism. So as you were saying, we are sort of this only species that has somehow managed to kind of exit ourselves from, from working within an ecosystem to purely extractivism. Now, one would argue that perhaps it is like the human mind that is capable of sort of denying reality or tricking ourselves to the extent that we think such a thing is possible. Um, and certainly pronatalism as a tool of women's oppression over the past 10,000 years would be a really effective way of doing that, essentially, of exiting oneself from the ecosystem. It keeps half of your population busy with child rearing. It, it involves a, a domination and a spread out of one's own genes. And then as the population increases, obviously, it demands more and more resources. Can you talk to that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, so you actually said it very well, is that pronatalism is a tool that's used to um, use women's bodies as reproductive vessels for external agendas. And what are the external agendas? Who benefits from this growth? Well, there are so many mm. institutions. Religion wants more followers. Mm. Uh, corporations want more consumers. Um, politicians want more taxpayers. You know, there's this perpetual uh, obsession with growth, economic growth. And so, well, we need more workers and taxpayers to keep the economy going. Um, and then there's all sorts of other reasons, you know, ethnocentrism, militarism, um, uh, nativism, nationalism, uh, where we want more of our own. So, uh, to prevent other people, the wrong kind of crowd, quote unquote, to outnumber us. So there's all sorts of reasons um, that pronatalism shows up in um, within culture and within institutions. But then also, you know, media and um, family. So as you said, you know, kind of carrying on your own genealogical legacy and carrying on family and cultural traditions uh, is also very strong. Pronatalism is also very strong there. So if you were to look at um, pronatalism, it can actually be seen as the, the ocean, the water in which we are swimming. It is so pervasive. It is so ever present that we don't even have the wherewithal or the capacity for the most, most people, many people around the world to explore what is it that we might truly want to do with our lives. It is such an automatic for people based on um, cultural expectations, uh, perpetuated by media, perpetuated by social media, popular culture, glorification, sentiment, sentimentalization of pregnancy, parenthood, the baby bump, mommy blogs, wherever you look, it is just, it's pro proliferated with this bias towards parenthood being the most fulfilling path. And, you know, it's based on this false idea that we are all biologically wired to procreate. And that it's a natural rite of passage into adulthood. And so it, from that, it results in unrelenting pressures experienced primarily by women to have children in large families. And 
it's everywhere in conservative and liberal societies alike. So we might see, you know, lower fertility rates in more liberal countries, uh, but it doesn't mean pronatalism is absent here. It's still very much there. It shows up in different ways. I would love I would love to understand that um, a little bit more. And also, in fact, could we even just a little bit? I mean, are we not? So we pause. Are we? Are we not biologically wired to reproduce? Is that not sort of the fundamental driving force of of evolution and biological species? Well, we have the biological capacity to reproduce, but the desire to reproduce, um, especially kind of within our own species, if we were to look at, you know, we have enough research that shows that the desire to become a parent is not universal, even though we may all, most of us, um, may have the capacity to become biological parents. But the desire uh, is much more psychologically and socially constructed. Mm. Um, and so that's, because if we, if we look at research, we see that the desire actually falls on a spectrum. There are people who have absolutely no interest in parenthood, um, if they are pushed into it, they end up becoming bad parents or resentful parents. And then there are people who do have strong desires, and they do make wonderful parents, and it is their calling. And then there are a lot of other people who fall on the spectrum in between. So it's the, the what happens at the capacity to reproduce is often conflated with, well, everybody wants to and should do it. Um, so even these ideas of the biological clock, the maternal instinct, speaking, you know, of feminism and, and the construct of gender norms, um, the maternal instinct is one of those gender norms that was created um, that has found to be completely untrue. There is no such thing as um, a universal instinct that mothers or parents have. Um, it's not universal. Some may and some may not. But when we make something into a universal instinct and we sell it as that, we have people entering into one of, the, one of life's most consequential decisions, thinking that if they don't experience it or if they don't have it, something is wrong with them. And because we have such a um, desire to belong, as, a, mm. as social beings, we want to fit within the norms. And so we want to enter into things that people around us are doing and saying we should be doing because it's the singular path to fulfillment, to womanhood, to, you know, becoming a fuller adult. And because it's such an unexplored area for people, so many people enter into that decision without, you know, thinking very deeply about it and end up experiencing a lot of suffering and regret. Um, or, you know, they end up being unfit parents and children suffer as a result of that because mm. not a lot of forethought went into this decision because we were promised by society that this, was, this is what we're meant to do and this is what makes us responsible and normal, and adults, and all of the, you know, things that are attached to the idea of parenthood. And if you don't choose it, then you are selfish, irresponsible, narcissist, blah, 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 all of the, the things that come with um, you making a decision that you may have done so thoughtfully. Um, mm. And then, of course, there's all sorts of other stigmas around people who are unable to have children. Um, so this is because I've done kind of a global, um, you know, mapping of what's, how does pronatalism show up in, in all of the different places in the world. And I didn't do all the countries, but uh, we looked at, you know, a bunch of different cultures within different continents to see, well, how does it show up? Well, there are um, many places around the world, your inability to have a child can get you subjected to violence, divorce, social stigmatization, um, being disowned by your family, 
um, et cetera. So your identity is so deeply tied to reproduction, to your family, that an inability to reproduce can actually lead to a lot of negative consequences. So there's a lot of these punishments that are built in that prevent people from actually making authentic choices uh, that allow them to find fulfillment in life, whether that includes children or doesn't include children. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I think it's so funny, right? Because I think in my sort of uh, personalization of the internet, I mean, this is just stuff that I very rarely see. I think there was maybe... There was a fight going on with a, between a couple of Telegraph columnists in the UK about this thing of is it selfish or not to not have children? And it just like boggles my mind that we are still having that conversation or that people, A, that people could think that anybody else's decision to do something with their own lives about to achieve a sense of fulfillment is like inherently selfish and B, whether or not they have like the right to comment on it and like yes the sort of proprietorial nature of like women's bodies and their reproduction is just shocking it it truly is shocking but you can understand why these tropes are put into place it is a form of um putting you in your place it's a form of reminding you what your true role is in life uh these are I think a lot of progressives some sometimes buy into these debates without critically thinking about who they're lining up with. Uh, but these these kind, kinds of tropes have been put into place by uh, religious leaders. The Pope, for example, just last year made a very grand statement. I mean, the Vatican has been making these stat statements uh, on an annual basis that People without children are selfish. Well, why would the Pope make such a statement? The Pope doesn't have any children, first of all. Mm. But what vested interest does the Pope have in making such a judgment call about people who have or not have children and making such a generalized statement about selfishness? Has he done qualitative, quantitative research to show who's selfish and who's not selfish, how people without children are using their resources and time, mm. um, how people with children are using their resources and time. It's just ridiculous, but he's one of the biggest influencers in the world, right? Over, over a billion followers. But you can understand, well, what vested interest does the Pope have in shaming people without children? Well, religion benefits tremendously from having more children and more babies yeah. and more religious followers. So, so then this, you know, who else plays into this shaming card? Economists um, will often make comments or conservative leaders, politicians, uh, ethnocentric leaders um, will say things like that uh, because it threatens. So feminism or gender equality or liberalism threatens this traditional notion of masculinity and femininity and keeping people within their gender roles so that they can continue to, uh, well, you know, partly because society is a little more stable when everything is predictable and everyone's kind of playing their part mm -hmm. um, and not defying some of these norms, but also Marriage is strongly correlated with children. So pushing marriage, pushing children, um, keeps corporations, the baby industry, the car industry, the housing industry, uh, property development industry. You start following, you know, who are the vested interest people that benefit from shaming people who do not have children? or glorifying large families. And then you start to, you know, see that all of the lines kind of, for the most part, lead to growth. Growth mm -hmm. in your own kind, growth in GDP, uh, growth in consumerism, growth of religion, growth of, you know, a mm -hmm. certain ethnic tribe. Um, and all of those things undermine not just reproductive autonomy, they undermine the rights of the children that are simply seen as commodities to continue on that growth. But 
<clears throat> are we not seeing their messages failing slightly? Because women in uh, quote unquote developed country, the OECD nations, Western, Global North, we are having less children. We are dipping below the rate of population growth. So are there messages in their shaming not fundamentally failing as women are choosing to not engage in having children? What's the correlation there? Yeah, great point. Um, so once women generally, but I think just once people have um, arrived at a place in life where they have a, a high degree of autonomy, specifically reproductive autonomy, um, it is. It has been shown through research that it is extremely unlikely to get them to go back into mm. um, believing their governments or buying into these pronatalist tactics of baby bonuses or child tax credits, or um, you know, like Hungary has this n new uh, policy where people who have more than four children get our never pay taxes for the rest of their lives. Oh, her, no. um, Russia has <laughs> this <laughs> mother heroine award uh, for women who give birth to their 10th child. They get a medal and a million rubles. Oh my God. Um, you know, but these sound like egregious examples, but as, especially as um, populations are declining in countries because of gender equality, because of more economic empowerment, more education, um, and more opportunities to engage in creative endeavors, to engage in self-realization, people are choosing many more things, sometimes along with parenthood, sometimes instead of parenthood. Um, but for the most part, we are seeing the family size shrinking um, as, uh, you know, we, we do become more industrialized. And to your question, yes, all of these pronatalist tactics to bring back the fertility to a higher level uh, have not worked. Maybe they work for a tiny little bit of time because people who were planning to have children already might say, great, I get credit for this. I might as well do it now instead of next year. But for people who know they do not want children or more children, they're not likely to have a child make such a huge decision for some small tax bonus. So they do not work, um, but just because they do not work doesn't mean it's not a dangerous rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason being, uh, what we have also been seeing is a rise in right-wing populism as a result of a rise in liberalism. So there's been a backlash to feminism and gender equality and a backsliding of democracy in a lot of countries uh, where we are seeing coercive measures being put into place to ensure that women have children. That shows up in the form of abortion bans, mm. in the form of removing reproductive health care services, removing options for men to get vasectomies. Mm. Um, and just putting a lot of barriers in place to, for, for people to actually choose their own fertility size. Uh, and so that's when things become dangerous is when, well, the government is not just encouraging you to have children by throwing money at you. The government starts coercing you um, and, and basically taking away reproductive and personal autonomy. And that is starting to happen in a lot of countries around the world. Um, and especially, I mean, you saw that happen in the U.S. after yeah, 50 yeah, years yeah. of having, yeah. right? So, uh, mm. so that's definitely on the increase. Okay, so our developed nations are getting a little bit more coercive uh, because the birth rate is falling because women typically uh, have higher access to education and higher access to opportunities for self-realization and bodily autonomy and are unlikely to go back of their own accords after having achieved or received those kinds of benefits. Um, but population in, you know, developing nations is still absolutely booming. Um, mm -hmm. What about the argument then that, you know, the population will sort of 
naturally cap as all of the as all of the countries develop up to a certain point and women are allowed an education up to a certain point uh, and then birth rates surely would start to decline there perhaps as well isn't there an argument uh, amongst some sociologists that like well the the population rate will sort of naturally cap at around 10 billion and then start to decline um why is it that you think we simply cannot hang around and wait for that to happen uh, that we need to start sort of improving women's education and decreasing population now yes so i think there is this um fallacy that um, all of this great work that's, that has happened in terms of population decline in a lot of countries has just kind of automatically happened as countries have become more economically empowered and industrialized, and that somehow economic empowerment translates into reproductive empowerment. Um, and and that that's just going to keep happening as countries become more industrialized. It's just naturally going to happen. What a lot of people miss uh, in those trends is how many active campaigns of education, of um, higher access to reproductive health care services and contraceptives, of helping to change cultural norms oh, to see. allow women to choose smaller families, to choose what uh, some of some sociologists have called a latent desire toward smaller families. Um, women don't want to have 11, 12, 13 children. Uh, it's the cultural narratives, the norms, the patriarchal constructs that uh, push women to have large families, to, to kind of keep the patriarchy alive. And so um, any country where we have seen norms shift toward greater liberalism, toward greater gender equality, um, through campaigns, through access, you know, more access and education um, are, uh, is a result of those things. It's not just some hand of God, Byproduct. you know, thing that, that yeah. they just, yeah, it's, it's a very active campaigns. And so, uh, for people to say, well, it's, it's just going to happen, even in the projections from the UN, um, they have, you know, high, high, medium and low fertility calculations. And the difference is in billions. If things stay on course as they are now, that might happen, what you just said, 10 billion and then drop down. It could also go to 16 billion by the end of the century, or it could be a little bit lower. Right. But the difference is in billions, and that depends on, you know, if, if countries become more pronatalist or if countries become more liberal, if we are able to create that transition, the demographic transition, quickly. And I would argue, why not? quickly because the correlation between um, elevating rights, human rights, reproductive rights, gender equality, and low fertility is so strong and so causal that, um, you know, not engaging in these active reproductive norm-shifting campaigns to me seems like such a missed opportunity to um, elevate rights. and to save the environment, mm. uh, given the huge you know, impact that both our growing human population and our inequitable con you know, consumption is having on the planet. Mm. I mean, to go back to what you said at the beginning, that uh, since 1800, our population has grown by a factor of eight, but our consumption has grown by a factor of 100. That I mean, it's a terrible, terrible data point, but it's also fascinating because the vast majority of that consumption is being done by a minority of people still, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I'm glad you brought that up because this growth absolutely has been unequally distributed both in population and consumption, and that's what makes it a very complex issue. Uh, you know, our, our carbon emissions are a great proxy for consumption. Mm -hmm. And 
there are two parameters that we can use to look at our collective carbon dioxide emissions. One is the number of people, and one is the quantity each person uh, emits. And we see that, you know, when aggregated in terms of income, what you're pointing to is the richest half, which is high in upper middle income countries, emit 86% of the global carbon emissions. The bottom half only emits 14%. So climate change, uh, which is not the only environmental issue, but it is one of the largest issues that we're facing, is inextricably linked to economic inequality. Mm. It's a crisis that's driven by the greenhouse gas emissions of the haves that hits the have-nots the hardest. Mm. And it's, you know, because people living in the bottom half of the countries are also most vulnerable to climate change. And so, yeah. yes, the hyper-consumerism of the West has played a huge role in outsourcing the ecological degradation onto the global majority. Hmm. So I s suppose then this all becomes quite nuanced, and it's what I like most about your argument, that in terms of the climate crisis and resources, consumption is sort of the bigger immediate problem than population, given the vast inequitable distribution of resources that are available. Um, and given the populations that are going to be hit most. However, from a cultural perspective in terms of autonomy and self-realization and equ equity and equality and all of these things that we do need for a sustainable future, that involves women's liberation from the cultural norms that demand that they produce children in order to uh, propagate a patriarchal society. Um, yes. However, go on, go on. If you want to say something on that, please do. You might be asking that question next anyway, so let's see where you go. <clears throat> I was going to go to the nutters in Silicon Valley. Who are the? Uh... Okay. <laughs> let, let me uh, add a few more things on the population connection uh, here then. Absolutely. It has so much to do with uh, elevation of rights and reproductive autonomy um, as an end in and of itself. Yet... Um, just because the uh, you know population growth may be highest in developing countries, uh, consumption is highest in high and middle um, you know high and middle income countries, does not mean that there is no connection between the population and consumption um, impact combined impact on the environment. So you know how I talked about looking at the emission contributions by income and we look at, mm -hmm. you know, the disproportional impact of high income countries compared to uh, low income. When we look at the emission contribution by region, we see the other half of the picture. So Asia is home to 60% of the population. Um, so, you know, India and China being two of the largest uh, and then other Asian countries, but emits 49% of the global climate emission, uh, carbon emissions. So, you know, just because the standard mm. of living is lower does not remove the uh, consumption impact because if you look at the number of people, 60% of um, the population, of the world's population is concentrated in Asia we see 50% of the emissions coming from there. And it's not that everybody's living in, you know, substandard living conditions. The middle class, the, the middle class is the strongest growing in these developing economies in India uh, and China, for example. So the total emissions and per capita emissions tell very different stories. North Americans are consuming four times more than someone living in Asia, for example. Um, but, you know, the product of population and consumption, there's a lot more people right, uh, yeah. in Asia, even if they're consuming lower. So you really cannot disentangle the two right. things. Um, and then also in terms of equality, if we really are interested 
in leveling the playing field for people in terms of raising their standard of living so that uh, they can live more like, let's say, you guys in Europe, uh, not like North Americans. So um, we have seen that reducing consumption is a profoundly challenging issue. And global consumption trends for the last 50 years have only been increasing. And yet we know we absolutely must be moving toward a degrowth society, especially people uh, living who have been living so luxuriously um, for, for, you know, for such a long time. But human beings at every, all levels of consumption are negatively impacting the non-human world in different but equally destructive ways. And so I spoke a little bit about the middle class. According to the most recent findings by the Brookings Institute, the middle class is the fastest growing segment of the global population and is expected to reach 5 billion by 2030. So it's going to be, you know, half of the population in the next 20, 30 years is going mm. to be middle class. Sorry, what is it so, now as a reference point? Um, so, I mean, in seven years, we're going to get to five billion. So it's probably just a little bit lower than that. Um, okay. You know, probably four billion. Okay. And majority of that growth is coming from Asia. So we know it's um, inequitable for people to be living in um, such kind of low standard living conditions. And from a perspective of equity, we want people to be living in higher standard conditions, right? So we absolutely want people to increase their standard of living. And that's why it's a bit of a conundrum because, as I said earlier, we're already living at 75% overshoot, what, what the earth can generate. So to have a growing middle class, billions of more people joining a North American lifestyle or in a European lifestyle, which is what people aspire to do. People yeah. who are living in substandard living conditions do not choose to live that way. Yeah. So it's because they are forced to live that way. So people should have the right to move up in terms of their consumption. Um, and so... To be able to live comfortably and sustainably, which requires that we protect our natural systems, we restore our natural systems, and recognizing that we are in 75% overshoot, you start to understand that both the population and uh, consumption need to be addressed simultaneously. We need to be mm. fewer of us consuming a lot less. So, you know, on, on both sides, um, of the equation, whether it's high fertility, low consumptive, low fertility, high consumptive countries, uh, which is becoming less and less uh, clear, honestly, because the middle class is rising, you know, around the world. So it's it's harder and harder to draw that line of who's developed and who's developing. Um, yet uh, this, you know, this change needs to happen on both sides. Consumption and population both need to be addressed. Right. Okay. So fundamentally, we need, as you say, much fewer people. We need much fewer people also so that we can then allow for everybody to have a very fair, happy and healthy way of living rather than expecting a huge portion of the world's population to be living in substandard um, environments. Do we have a number? I know Phoebe exactly. Bernard thinks that it's 3 billion. Do you agree? Yeah, well, um, there's been uh, quite a few different ranges that have been calculated based on standards of living. And uh, currently the number is anywhere from 2 billion to 4 billion at a European standard of living. Because European is in the middle of the you know, egregiously excessive North American standard and then the egregiously low, um, you know, Asian or African standard of living. So, you know, that's the range. Of course, it's um, hard to put a number, exact number, on 
what the appropriate population is, but the reason it's nice to have a range is to help people understand and visualize uh, where we're at, how grossly overpopulated we are. And overpopulated here means, the, obviously, it's not just the population, but people consuming. Mm -hmm. um, overpopulation is intertwined with consumption. So how grossly we are in a state of overshoot, uh, you know, by a factor of two or four compared to where we should be. And that number is not that far from our history. Um, 50 years ago, just 50 years ago in 1970, we were at 4 billion. And that could be wow. what we say is, you know, a good standard of um, a good sustainable population. You go 100 years ago, in like 1920s, we were at 2 billion. Mm. So within people's lifetime, they have seen a growth of, you know, f two, two, three, four times uh, in population. So just as we have grown that quickly, we can also achieve that demographic tra transition within the same amount of time, within the next 50 to 100 years. And so what Phoebe was referring to was calculations by Dr. Chris Tucker, who wrote the book, A Planet of Three Billion. And according to him, if we actually could accelerate the demographic transition through some of the things I was mentioning, through gender um, uh, norm shifting, um, reproductive norm shifting, um, elevating of rights, a comprehensive sexuality education, starting at young age, ensuring that young people, especially girls, uh, go through, you know, more time in school, so high school and uh, university, the chances of, you know, fertility, the, the rate of fertility drops, the more education you have. And so all of the things that we would need to do are autonomy-enhancing, rights-based policies that have doubled the impact because you are, um, you know, you're actually elevating human rights in one way of just in and of itself. In the other way, you're elevating human and ecological justice because population growth itself is a cause of a lot of human and social crises. Mm. Um, ecological, obviously, um, but, you know, for people who worry about, you know, well, what does that mean? Are we going to call people? Um, you know, are we, what, what kind of things do we need mm -hmm. to engage in to reduce population? Um, and, and one of the most well-known columnists uh, in the UK, I'm sure you know of him, George Monbiot, um, is yeah. really confused about this area. You know, he's brilliant in so many ways. And yet, when it comes to population, he has caused so much damage and um, created so much misinformation by, by claiming that anyone who wants to talk about population is inevitably suggesting that we call people. It's a gross lack of imagination and understanding of how population growth happens, that it's premised, you know, on patriarchal uh, exploitation of women. Um, and to say that people who are talking about population are racist and eugenicist uh, creates, has created so much, um, you know, negativity and silencing of the discourse within the left because of people like him who do not want to engage in this conversation in a critical way. Hmm. Oh, I mean, it is complicated. I remember so much of this back and forth with Phoebe when I interviewed her, um, because obviously any movement can be co-opted by people with um, malicious intent. And so no doubt we will see that in the future. We will see the conversation around population being co-opted by eugenicists or racists and surely that is happening already somewhere in the corner of the internet um 
And I think it speaks to the world that we live in that it isn't automatically understood as a question of women's rights. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and exactly. And it's not just um, that it can be co-opted. It has been co-opted. Uh, a lot of these fears mm -hmm. and sensitivity around population uh, connection exist because um, there were some people, again, lacking in imagination of what it would actually take to stabilize and reduce population that didn't require forcibly sterilizing people mm. um, or, you know, f forcibly um, aborting them, mm. uh, their, their children, their fetuses to, uh, you know, to um, stabilize population. So, you know, we have seen past policies that were uh, gross violations of reproductive rights. We've seen China's one-child policy, the forced sterilization program in Puerto Rico and in India, um, all of which used coercive means to control people's population swiftly. And not only were they awful, gross violations of autonomy, they also backfired because they basically tainted all of the great work that was being done in empowering and reproductive norm shifting campaigns through education, through family planning and reproductive health care programs, it tainted all of those uh, policies and campaigns with the blemish of coercion. People just mm. thought the only way that you can control, quote unquote, the population is by forcing people to not have children instead of, well, thinking, you know, maybe expanding your imagination a little bit and saying, what's causing population growth? Patriarchal population control in the other direction that uses women's bodies to promote uh, reproduction in order to meet other reproductive, other, um, you know, political or nationalistic or religious or economic agendas. If you neutralize pronatalism, if you actually give people true autonomy to decide, you know, if, when, with whom, how many children to have, you do see what we see in a lot of uh, developed nations. It's not perfect, but it's close to what is possible. Yes, <laughs> undoubtedly. Uh, I've sometimes have wondered, you know, what, what is the mathematical thing? Like, does, is it that every two people need to have one child? Like, should we all sort of, if anybody is, does really want a kid, um, but is also wants to do right by the planet and politics and all this kind of stuff, should we all be thinking one, one is enough, one's it? Um, I, I mean, I hesitate to recommend uh, a number, sure. but. I think for people, <laughs> we know what targets in the past have led to and how they are perceived, you know, as, as prescriptive and therefore it can be, as you said, co-opted by the wrong people, mm -hmm. uh, turn them into policies. But for free thinking, relatively free thinking people um, who have a greater um, access to reproductive autonomy and wealth and privilege, um, relatively speaking, it's a question that we should be thinking about so deeply. Um, definitely, given the time uh, that we find ourselves in, in terms of planetary crisis, um, but also just, um, I would say this is a universal message. It doesn't matter if we are in a state of overshoot. Let's say 100 years from now, we, we find ourselves living harmoniously uh, in nature. Um, it's a question we should be asking ourselves anytime, any, anytime, you know, in, in space and time is, um, do I want to have a child? Why do I want to have a child? What impact will that have on my personal life? What are the costs? What, what are the benefits? Um, what about the rights of that prospective child? Mm. Do, um, do I have what it takes to provide a good life for that new human being? Um, and, you know, if I really do want a, a biological child to really explore, where is that want coming from? 
Is it constructed through societal expectations? Is it coming through pressures from family? Is it because we see in media that pregnancy and parenthood is celebrated? It's the promise of perfection of becoming parents. You know, and so there's so many things to parse out and dissect. And and Mm -hmm. I would say anyone who engages in that exercise has done a great deal more work than someone who has a child by default because it's an expectation. It's because what everyone does. And so at that point, if you really have explored deeply um, the, and you decide that you still would love to have the experience of a connection with a biological child, then, um, you know, then I would say in terms of limits to really think about the impact given the disproportionate impact people living in industrialized countries have on carbon emissions. Um, on ecological footprint, um, and what the birth of that child, the impact of the birth of that child has on other people in the world who are more marginalized. Um, And at this point in time, also to recognize that studies are showing that children born today or in the future are five to seven times, um, you know, more vulnerable to climate crises um, than past generations. So to also think about the implications um, of what that child may inherit in this Mm. world. Um, You know, but it doesn't mean that we have to basically forego parenthood uh, if we are to achieve a sustainable population in the next 50 to 100 years. Um, I think what you said, you know, One is a really lovely uh, number, partly because it gives you the experience of parenthood. Um, It allows you to have that bond if if you really want that bond through biological connection. And that, you know, if you do want to grow the size of your family, adoption of another human or animal is a great, you know, um, pathway forward. The, the difference between no children and one child for someone who really wants to experience parenthood is profound. Mm. The difference between one and two, two and three, is not that great because you've experienced everything you possibly could from being mm. a parent. And then the, the differences are incremental. Mm. So, you know, pronatalism has other myths around the only children are selfish or they don't you know, grow up that uh, responsible or well, and those are all <laughs> what it, what it, what I just said it is. They're myths. That's not true. Um, so, as as an lots, only child, <laughs> lots to think about. <laughs> I love all the myths around it. I think they're really, really funny. Um, I think, I think, but the main thing is like statistically, only only children um, are ve- very very high achievers because they have so many more resources, right, than kids that come from families of more than one child. And I think there's a couple of things that I just want to like tease out from what you said that I think are really important. Uh, I'm reading Bell Hooks on Love at the moment, and uh, the chapter that I read last night was about community and how hmm. you know love should be about the communal love that we have for everyone, and we should have imbue our friendships and our family and our neighborhoods with love instead of sort of idolizing, you know, this romantic relationship. And what it made me think of and everything that you were saying is that because of this, like this obsession with the nuclear heterosexual, typically family, um, we are denying ourselves the opportunity of experiencing parenthood by helping raise the children of the people around us, essentially. You know, I have one of my best friends has a child I get such joy whenever I see him. It makes me want to weep. And I wish, I think frequently, I wish I was just there more. I wish I lived in the same country as them in order to participate more in that. Because we could all give to each other more of the human experience by sharing what we have collectively rather than being forced to reproduce every single bit of that experience ourselves individually. Um, I couldn't have said it better. You just captured it so perfectly. 
Uh, it truly is. Uh, it's a new way of re. It's a it's a way of redefining what family means, what love means, what community means. It doesn't need to be connected by blood or biology. Um, you know, we find love uh, and meaning through so many different endeavors, through so many different relationships, and it's really time for us to expand our thinking around what it means to be connected, be in relationship. Even as we talk about aging societies, that's the, the newest trope that governments are uh, pushing us into, you know, we need to have more babies because the population is aging. Well, you look at how people who are elderly are being depicted as decrepit, burdensome, worthless, you know, uh, they need all of these resources and medical care and just as if their status has just been demoted from being a human being to, to no longer yeah. being useful or productive to our economy, yeah. which, which is really how we measure people. Yeah. And it's such a demeaning way of looking at elderly as burdensome babies, as commodities that, that yeah. help us increase our productivity. Yeah. And so what would it mean for us to be in community in such a way where people aren't siphoned off into these age groups of like, yeah. well, you're old now, you've got to live in retirement home and whatnot, but, but rather what you envision just now is what would a communal living style look like where you have multi-generational families that may not be connected by biology, but just by interest, by values. Uh, yeah. Where we do, you know, take care of one another rather than looking at people through the lens of productivity and youthfulness. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I, it, we just seem to be missing a trick in so many areas. I mean, even the treatment of the elderly and the fact that, like, we sort of package them off to these homes where they're only around other old people and they're just waiting to die, essentially. And, you know, you don't see them out on the streets. Like, they, they, certainly a nation like the UK, it's not built for the young and it's not built for the old. It's built for workers. And I remember a couple of yes. years ago chatting to a friend and I was like, we we're talking about, you know, the, the crisis of, of um, childcare, the fact that it's just so expensive. I was like, there are so many people sitting in retirement homes with nothing to do who would love, who would love to look after a kid or two for the yes. day and who are perfectly capable of it. And that would probably keep them keep them alive in a sense it would give them a sense of vitality that has been stolen from them by being segregated from the rest of the population such such an important point yes mm. and we also have research that shows that you know the longer people stay engaged in creative endeavors in education uh in relationship uh the better your mental health is as you get mm. older um and and also you know, people are living longer, healthier lives. So people aren't really getting old, old until mm. much later in life. So it, you know, maybe in late 80s or 90s, it starts to hit um, in, in some of the, you know, developed countries a little bit earlier in others. But 65 is what we consider retirement, you know, in a lot of countries. Yeah. And people are still in their youth uh, you know, at, at that time compared to how long we used, to, you know, how short our lifespans were at the time. So yeah. I completely agree with you. It allows for intellectual um, as well as, you know, communal stimulation uh, to, to remain engaged with multi-generational uh, communities. Absolutely. It's so critical. I know that we're running over. But we have to talk about the effect of altruism thing if I can keep you. Um, because I'm kind of obsessed with these absolute nut jobs. Um, and I'm obsessed at their like flagrant racism that they seem to be completely unaware of. Um, so for anybody listening, some context, and please correct me on the context if I get it wrong. Effective altruism is a movement that was created by this British philosopher that was all about measuring the impact of philanthropy. And in its bones, it's a really... It, it is an important idea. Like, let's get some data on charity, essentially. 
It then went to the USA and kind of got co-opted by Silicon Valley. And essentially now a bunch of tech bros and gals have decided that the only way to save the planet from its inevitable destruction is by them having 10 children who will then go on to have 10 children each. And they quite literally want to replace vast swaths of the population with these ultra elite white upper middle class technologist kids. And there's one couple in particular, Simone and Michael, I think, Collins. Malcolm. Malcolm. Simone and Malcolm Collins, who uh, have even created a website and like a business trying to help these ultra elite middle class white technologists uh, find a way to have a bunch of children. And they hope that their own offspring, their own genetic lineage will be 10% of the United States population in like 50 years time or 100 years time or whatever. They are absolutely nuts. Nandita, could you tell us your professional opinion on it? Because obviously I'm only an amateur. <laughs> well, I, in very simple language, I want to say it, it kind of brings back <laughs> something that has been tried before. Okay. Uh, it makes me want to say eugenics 2.0. <laughs> um, yeah. Now that it's being <laughs> co-opted by these wealthy white elites, um, I think you described effective altruism um, way better than than I I would have. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but I do know um, that it you know it did. It started kind of through this animal rights lens of how to do most good and least harm for animals, and in terms of charities and. It's a utilitarian way of thinking of what good means and what harm means. And, you know, it has its own limits. But, you know, when you apply it to uh, smaller decisions, then it makes it easy for you to, you know, invest or donate <clears throat> uh, to charities that you think are um, going to maximize the benefit of your dollars. But you are absolutely right. It's been co-opted by these wealthy elites who um, want to proliferate the world with their own kind. Um, and part of effective altruism now believes that um, the uh, what we owe um, is not to the people and the non-human world that is currently alive, um, but we owe the maximum amount of happiness and benefit to the people that are going to exist in the future. Because mm -hmm. right now we're in the billions. In the future, we might be in the trillions if we haven't eviscerated the planet <laughs> by then. So that's, that's the other thing that's missing with these tech bros is they are completely ecologically blind. <laughs> There's no understanding of planetary limits. There is no understanding of limits to growth of, of any type. Mm -hmm. um, there is this fantasy in which they live where um, everything is about conquest and colonization of mm -hmm. the planet, and it allows you to forget and dismiss the here and now, the suffering of the here and now, because you can convince yourself that those in the future will be so many more than those who exist now. So yeah. even if it means we can just let these poor people and let these current populations suffer and die out, um, our allegiance is to the future many more people. And so it allows you to stay in a fantasy land where you can continue to convince yourself that you can just make lots more money because all that money that you're making off of exploitation and extraction of the natural world and marginalized communities is for the greater good in the future. And so you can justify uh, decimating the planet in the here and now because you're so good hearted <laughs> that you're thinking about all of the future beings and their happiness. So I, I don't know what else to say other than it's the most ridiculous ecologically blind, arrogant, supremacist uh, kind of thinking that is picking up steam among these wealthy elites. Yeah. And it's extremely dangerous because of the sheer degree of power that they have. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, it's important not to laugh at them too much. You're right, um, because they have access to such important spaces. Um, I think it's quite revealing as well, isn't it, of of the, I don't know, cultural or political philosophy that they must have already existed in that has kind of was kind of hidden. And what I mean by that is, you know, we do live on exploitation and extraction and uh, white supremacy and all of these things, but they were kind of in the nineties, you know. They were quite harder to pinpoint whilst things were sort of typically going, getting better and better for everyone. And now it's like all of that ugliness has just come out in force. I mean, the fact that you have Mexican children being kept still in cages, um, uh, begging for and families begging for entry into this country. And then you have these Silicon Valley types that are having 10 kids because, well, there's just not going to be enough children. Uh, and so we need to protect our nation it's just the, the the cognitive dissonance is incredible and it just proves that the whole ideology is like built on a very sincere and disgusting racism um yes and yes. white supremacy as you say yes yeah and it's good to call call it what it is uh because the fear is the fear of this population collapse what they keep calling and Elon Musk is of course uh leading the charge on it and these Collinses and Elon Musk now, you know, are in cahoots with one another. Um, they're not worried about population decline. They're worried about population decline of a certain kind of population. Yeah. Um, and they want to take matters in their own hand to help raise the fertility um, of certain populations. But also, I think, you know, if... It's racist in a couple of other different ways, too, because it's not just about outnumbering the black and brown people with white supremacist kind of people like their kind, but it's also about keeping the power structure alive because mm -hmm. um, as long as uh, poorer countries continue to have high birth rates, um, there's a lot to be gained from their disempowerment for elites and the ruling class because you can essentially continue to engage in modern-day slavery um, through cheap labor, through extraction of their resources because yeah. a lot of people are not in a position to advocate for ecological justice or environmental justice where they live because not only do they have you know, do they lack reproductive autonomy? They don't even have control over their own bodies, uh, yeah. where children are working as uh, slaves in a lot of these um, countries where uh, many of these precious, precious me metals exist. So yeah. I think it's a two-pronged uh, approach to power, uh, not that different from slavery, um, where you want people to keep reproducing the working class because you want more competition that drives down wages um, and people to remain disempowered, certain people to remain disempowered. And so it's just a really twisted and horrible um, fantasy, which, you know, with, with Elon Musk having 129 million Twitter followers, it's not a small deal for him to be yeah. spreading this kind of disinformation. And that's why I think it's dangerous for people um, with that low level of intelligence in terms of, you know, planetary intelligence to be engaging in this kind of propaganda. Very good point. That is exactly what it is. Propaganda indeed. Um, and I think that that's where we should wrap it up, actually, because I think that is a very important note to take away, that not only does population need to decline and our consumption needs to decline and all of these factors that you've really brilliantly teased out for us, but that there is also a campaign against that by people in power that needs to be fought in order to empower black and brown girls and boys um, who have been victim of colonialism for 500, 600, 700 you know, millennia now, essentially. So Nandita, thank you so much for this. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. Um, and the only thing I, I wanted to add, it's, it is mm -hmm. about empowering 
all young people, everyone, everywhere, yeah. because pronatalism is harming everyone. Um, you know, the fact that half of the pregnancies are unplanned in the United States, mm -hmm. um, and the United States is considered an industrialized country, um, it's uh, it's not that different. I think it just shows, patriarchy shows up in different ways in different places, yeah. and yeah. sometimes it gets co-opted by the liberal lefties who think they're doing us a favor by saying things like, you can have children and fight climate change at the same time mm -hmm. and not realizing who they're lining up with. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, really thank point. you. Thank you so much for having me. It was, what a fascinating conversation. You asked such wonderful questions and you had such great contributions. Oh, thank you so much. What a lovely thing to hear. <laughs> Um, my final question for you, of course, is who would you like to platform? Well, two of my, um, you know, most influential uh, people are uh, Dr. Eileen Christ. She is um, a sociologist who uh, has also done a lot of work in challenging human supremacy and fighting for an ecological civilization and, and really deeply understands the whole population consumption um, connection. Mm -hmm. And then the other one I mentioned during the call was Dr. Bill Reese, who is an ecologist and also the co-creator of The Ecological Footprint, mm -hmm. uh, another brilliant, brilliant man who has informed my thinking in uh, very deep ways. Wonderful. Well, I can't wait to speak to both of them, hopefully. Nandita, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. To find out more about Nandita's work at Population Balance, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.